Hello, I'm Scott Birch. I'm the manager of the Research Technologies Advanced Visualization Lab. And today we're here in Brian Overshiner's 3D Innovations Lab uh, to learn about a little bit about what he does. The lab was founded in 2017 uh, as part of the IU Health System. And uh, there's a lot of really cool things that Brian does. So uh, can you tell me a little bit about how the lab got started? What was your idea to get this going? Yeah, so um, 3D printing uh, was a personal hobby of mine that I picked up uh, way back in 2014. Um, and it was just one of those things where I, I came across 3D printing and I, I was really mesmerized by it and I, it, it just kind of intrigued me. I wanted to learn about it. So I went out and bought a printer, started printing on my own. Um, as I got better at it, and uh, I wanted to think of ways that I could actually help my clinic um, in radiation oncology. Uh, my background is actually in radiation therapy, so for the last couple decades I've actually treated cancer patients uh, with radiation. Um, but I wanted to use my 3D printing skills to try to make patients' treatment better. So that was the inspiration for, for really starting the lab, was figuring out how to use modern technologies to improve patients' treatments. So what was like uh, when you're trying to get support of leadership in IU Health, what were some of the things that you talked about uh, to get them on your side, to get them on board, to, to get the funding? Um, yeah, great question. Um, I will say I am very, very fortunate that uh, I had very supportive leadership. And um, when I told them kind of some of the ideas that I had, um, they, they allowed me time in the clinic to work on it, which um, this day and age is unheard of. Like well, I, my boss would actually come to me and say, hey, I have a few hours free you want to work on your 3D printing stuff, go ahead, I'll cover you in the clinic. Um, so it was really, really great uh, to have that support. Um, the thing that really helped everything was actually showing them like the finished product, like the actual 3D printed objects and how they would be used. And once everybody actually saw them working and, and understood the process, um, I think that really went a long way to getting further support from the system. What were some of the first objects that you printed and, and what type of printer were you using? Um, yeah, so the very first object I ever printed uh, was a very small little uh, peg that went on an um, a apparatus that we used for breast cancer treatment. So it actually held the uh, head, head cup where you rested your head. So the ladies would lay down on an inclined board, their head would rest in a little cradle, and it had pegs that would hold it in place, uh, different locations, and those pegs would break a lot of times. You know, you take it off the table, or you know, maybe a student accidentally bumped it, um, broke it, broke it off, and they just didn't sell that particular part. You had to buy the whole apparatus, which is very expensive. So, uh, me as a beginning printer and a beginning uh, novice CAD model, I went home and made a little peg, printed it out, came back and fixed the equipment the next day, and. Um, my manager was like, this is amazing. You just saved us a whole lot of money and we don't have to interrupt anybody's treatments. So, you know, what else can you fix? So um, that kind of just started from there, snowballing into other projects. Um, people around the hospital would hear we had 3D printing capabilities and come ask us to fix equipment or modify equipment. Um, and this kind of started from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, a lot of times the 3D printer is the, the end result uh, of what you're seeing here, but uh, the modeling part can be a part of the challenge of getting yes. the data itself. Uh, there's no kind of medical thing verse that you can go and, and download. So can you tell a little bit about how you get the 3D models, how you acquire the data? What are yes. some of the modalities that you use? So for the line of work that we do in the medical, uh, medical field, a lot of our data is coming from patient's imaging, so uh, CAT scanning, MRI, possibly even ultrasound, um, things like that nature. So we take that data from the patients and then we have to put it in some special software that basically segments out the, the organs of the patient. So if we're, for example, needing to um, you know, print this model of uh, the maxilla for a surgical case, we would actually take that patient's imaging and create these models from that image uh, in specialized FDA approved software that's made for clinical uh, use. And then we use uh, high quality 3D printers uh, to print these models out and then take them to the surgeons. Um, so it's a little bit of a process. Uh, it, just like learning how to 3D print, there's a whole learning curve associated with, you know, just operating the software that's necessary to, uh, to, get, these, to get these models. So uh, I see a lot of these models are, uh, seem to be made of different materials, have different kind of uh, reflective qualities and different kind of uh, shore values and hardness and, right. and rubber uh, qualities. Could you uh, show, uh, tell me a, a little bit about some of the things I'm seeing on the table yeah, right absolutely. here? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the great thing about 3D printing 
um, is there are many, many different materials uh, that are available that can be 3D printed these days. Um, everything from carbon fiber based materials to completely flexible materials, biocompatible materials. So um, a lot of times um, our lab will choose the type of material based upon uh, you know, the, the, the request that we get or the job that we're doing. So if it's an anatomical model that somebody's just going to study or use for education, um, you know, obviously we're going to use this out of just, you know, a low cost thermoplastic. This, um, if we're doing something where it's going to be a patient uh, treatment device like this brachytherapy applicator here, um, this is actually going to touch a patient. So this is actually printed out of a biocompatible certified material. So uh, we always take into consideration how the material will be used. Maybe this material needs to be strong. Uh, maybe it does need to be flexible for whatever case or be biocompatible, sterilizable. So um, that will basically dictate what type of 3D printer we use. Um, but yes, you have so many different um, materials these days. Um, and it just depends on the application. Uh, tell me about this one right here. There seems to be multiple colors, multiple yes, materials, yes. all in one single model. Um, can you tell me about that? Yeah, this is a this is a heart model that we um, that we three D printed. Um, and for those of you who don't know, when you get a three D models, sometimes they may or may not have color data along with that model, um, especially if you're creating it yourself uh, from a patient's CAT scan. So this was uh, going to be a teaching model for for a heart. Uh, so we 3D printed it, and uh, a really good close friend of mine is a is an artist, um, and we said, "Hey, could you make this realistic for us uh, for teaching?" And so he actually hand painted this uh, himself. Uh, his name's Ron Shaw, really talented artist. So uh, this just gave us uh, a really good representation and just kind of you know that extra wow factor, um, you know, for for you know showing uh, the vessels and the parts of the heart. So it's interesting, you mentioned two different kind of uses already of models. One is for, for client uh, teaching, uh, kind of showing uh, general anatomy features, and these other ones are very specialized uh, right. for treatment. So it's an interesting gamut and, and a range of applications that you can have for uh, these kind of similar workflows. Uh, can you tell me what this object is right here? Yeah, so um, this is kind of what kicked off everything for me in the 3D lab. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I started 3D printing little bits and pieces for equipment and things like that. Um, the the kind of breakthrough moment for me and what really uh, gave me the full support from the hospital to start this lab was this this device here, which you see is, and we call this radiation therapy bolus. Um, what bolus is used for is a certain subset of patients that have superficial cancer. Um, so we're talking skin cancer, breast cancer, head and neck cancers, or anything superficial where the disease uh, is superficial on the body. So normally when we treat cancer, um, the ionizing radiation goes clear deep in your body and delivers the dose. And that's, that's great for deep tumors like lung and liver and things like that. But um, for these superficial cases, um, we don't want that dose going deep in the body. So Literally for the last two decades and still in a large part of the industry now, um, the way we kind of get around that problem is we actually put a material like this, which is a tissue equivalent gelatin. We actually lay that on the body itself and we stack it up at a calculated depth. So what happens now, that beam is going to penetrate all this extra tissue and not allow the dose to go deep in the body. It's going to shift that dose up to the surface where the disease is at. Um, so as you can see right away, when I put this on a body, um, you notice it doesn't fit very well. You have all these gaps and um, you know creases and things, and this is really detrimental to the radiation treatment because the, the radiation is not evenly distributed in the body. Um, this was a known problem, um, and we just kind of had to get around that the best we could. Um, I had the idea back in 2015 of saying, hey, is there a way I can use a 3D printer to make a better fitting radiation device? Um, and so with some help from folks on campus, um, actually Scott's 3D innovation, or uh, sorry, advanced visualization lab, they helped me take that CT DICOM data and create 3D models of that. And from those models, we then created molds to where we could actually cast out of FDA approved silicone an exact piece that for made custom for each patient that fits like a second skin. So you can see this would come out of this 3D printed mold kind of just crack it apart like an egg once the silicone's um, set, goes right onto the patient, fits perfectly, and that yielded a much, much better treatment for that um, patient population. So um, we were one of the very first sites in the country ever to do this. Uh, we still are 
probably one of the very um, early pioneers in this. Um, and we've now done over 350 patients with this method. Uh, we now do it for every clinic that IU Health has in the state of Indiana. So we're constantly shipping these devices out to other clinics. Um, so yeah, it was a great, a great win for the 3D lab and helped kind of put us on the map, so to speak. So. I like this that it's not just the, the, the 3D print isn't the end result like some of these models as a, a training model. Um, it's the means to get to another end using right. maybe traditional kind of manufacturing techniques with, with materials such as silicon or, or um, urethane rubber uh, where the, the 3D printed part is kind of a disposable mold. Uh, once it's had its use, it, it cracks apart or dissolves if it's right. a dissolvable filament, leaving, with, uh, leaving you with a thing that you're actually trying to make. So I right. think the flexibility of 3D printing uh, if you can ex really expand uh, the use to it um, as, a, as a tool to get to another uh, step in, the, yes. in a diagnostic or clinical process. I think that yeah. is really interesting. Yeah, it is, it is a great tool and it's just another tool in the arsenal um, for healthcare providers. Um, you know, we, we print these models. These are tools essentially we give to surgeons to help them prepare for their surgical cases. Um, models like this and like what Scott's showing, these um, help prepare them for the, the surgery cases themselves before they ever walk step foot into that operating room. They've worked out exactly what they're going to do, exactly where they're going to go. This was a trauma case that was done for the Methodist trauma unit. We had a patient that was bleeding into the right side lung. Uh, the imaging that was given to, given to them was not very good quality, um, which is typical in a trauma case sometimes, um, given what the patient's got going on. Uh, they knew it was coming from the right side. They just didn't know exactly where. They were going to have to do exploratory surgery. We printed this model for them, and as soon as we handed it to the surgeon, they immediately saw where the, 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 the uh, problem area is, this little banding that was happening right here. So to the naked eye or to the layperson, it wouldn't look like anything, but to that surgeon, he knew exactly where the problem was happening, and he knew exactly where to do that surgery. So, you know, that just helps give better patient outcomes um, from, you know, a little bit of plastic that was 3D printed. So it's really amazing. It's a very really powerful tool. I think a uh, thing that's interesting about this is too is, is uh, clinicians have a lot of diagnostic tools at their disposal. You've got uh, imaging tools, a lot of computer screens, uh, but adding these tactile modalities and, and segmenting data from these 2D data stacks into these actual physical 3D models that you can hold in your hand really does kind of create uh, an opportunity to get new insight into these cases um, that you wouldn't otherwise have if you're just looking at a 2D computer screen. So that story right there is, I think, really impactful by, um, by taking a new modality of learning right. and applying it to a problem and seeing that solution right away, I think is, is a really powerful thing. So what are these uh, pieces right here? Right? Yeah, so, um as I mentioned before, there's many, many different materials that are able to be 3D printed these days, um, especially for what I do in the radiation oncology world. Um, if we make something that may interact with um, x-rays or radiation, for, for example, we want to know what the density of that material is. So what we, what we do with these is actually 3D print um, what we call a plug of the material. And we actually CT scan this and we get the density out of the material. So we know exactly um, what that radiation is going through, and then we can uh, uh, calculate for that in our, in our radiation calculations if it happens to pass through there. Um, so yeah, we test all of our materials. Um, we sometimes take them over to the engineering school and do tensile strength testing on it. So if we have an application where somebody requests a very strong part, we know exactly what material uh, is appropriate for that. So um, it's just validating our material. Um, we take a very professional approach to 3D printing in the hospital, as you can imagine. Um, our machines that you see in the background, those are constantly QA to make sure they are accurate and working and performing properly. Um, and then we take the same approach with our materials to make sure we know exactly um, how to manipulate that material and the properties of it. Excellent. So. These are some uh, great projects that we've seen, but what's next for your lab? What are your future plans? Uh, what are you working on now? Um, so we are um, continuing to develop our modeling program. Um, our goal is to get an entire team here in the 3D lab um, where we have a team dedicated to doing nothing but radiation and surgical patients. Um, we are also investigating um, newer technologies like virtual reality um, and how that can be implemented with patients as well. We've just completed a pilot study 
with the infusion group uh, where we actually had patients going through VR experiences while they're getting chemotherapy. And we got some really great results with um, decreasing anxiety, decreasing stress um, during the treatments using VR. So um, we're excited about looking at other technologies to help patients. So, um, and right now we are just an open door to all clinicians here in the hospital. So if you have an innovative idea um, this lab gives you a place to start. Um, come see us. We'll prototype it. We'll get it out to the clinic for you to test it. Um, so yeah, we're just we're just an open door and excited to work in, and, and foster that innovation spirit here in the hospital. That's great. Uh, we at the Advanced Visualization Lab also specialize in kind of developing specialized workflows to visualize and, and solve problems, uh, no matter what it might be in, in the sciences or medicine. So I think this is a really excellent way to partner uh, with visualization and some of our skill sets um, with the hands-on health uh, um, uh, medical usage of this technology. So I think that's a really powerful uh, type of thing that we could continue to explore. Absolutely. So thank you very much for showing uh, me this stuff. I think it's really fascinating. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out either to the Advanced Visualization Lab or to the IU Health 3D Innovations Lab um, if you want more information. Thank you so much, Brian. Thanks Appreciate a lot, it. Scott.